got really quiet in here. <laughs> <laughs> I guess that's a good thing. Uh, I'm Mike Sprague. I'm the director of the Polar Institute here at the Wilson Center, along with my colleague Ross Virginia. We are the co-lead scholars for the Fulbright Arctic Initiative 2. And the reason it's 2 is because we had the first cohort <coughs> excuse me, uh, during the U.S. chairmanship of the Arctic Council. We saw the Fulbright program, and I'll talk a more about that in a bit. We saw the Fulbright program as complementary to what the Arctic Council was doing, certainly complementary to the U.S. chairmanship, and we believe complementary to the chairmanship and leadership of Iceland during these next two years. Uh, today is a number of things. Today is a celebration of the work done by 16 incredible scholars. You will hear about that more soon. Uh, this is work that was done um, of the Arctic, of the Arctic and for the Arctic, because all of us either live in the Arctic or we have a passion about the Arctic. And it was driven by, I think, three different things. One was these Fulbright scholars were driven by a mission, not some distant goal, but by a mission, a current mission. Uh, also, the work that they have conducted and will continue to conduct far beyond this Fulbright celebration uh, they wanted it to be applicable now to communities, to policymakers, to governments, to regions, most importantly to communities. And third, there was a sense of urgency among these scholars, uh, something that perhaps in, in the academy we may not often feel as we think about papers we want to write, presentations we want to write, tenure files we'd like to have, uh, and just general policymakers. But with this group, there was a sense of urgency, and I think you'll see that here. These Fulbright scholars have been together, working together for 18 months, but really it's been a two-plus year program of selection. I'll talk a little bit about that uh, later on. Selection, bringing teams together, helping individual scholars do their work. Again, driven by policy-relevant uh, motivations, not just an academic exercise. And it was really research with a focus on actionable results, which you'll hear more about in a moment. As the nation's think tank, we're honored to be a part of the Fulbright family. Ross and I now have been a part of Fulbright coming up on six years. Uh, we'll talk more about that later. But it really is the power of Fulbright to attract, attract and project the issues of our day, whether it's 70 years ago or, or now. And certainly having a Fulbright Arctic Initiative created, elevated, and then executed by the State Department is nothing but good for those of us who focus on all issues of the Arctic. And as have we have seen, as you have seen, uh, the Arctic is no longer in this Arctic exceptionalism. It's no longer a bubble of, of politics and, and, and policy. It now is part of the larger uh, international frame of discussions. So we thought, who better to kick off this keynote than the ambassador uh, from the country of Iceland? Because Iceland currently leads the Arctic Council. Uh, this is an agenda that's developed by the country of Iceland, but in coordination and consultation with the other seven nations. It really is quite unique, the Arctic Council. But we're very happy to have the ambassador here. Uh, and Ambassador Ellis Dodder has been the ambassador of Iceland to the United States for a whopping three or four months. <laughs> Two months. It was less whopping than I thought. <laughs> Prior to her appointment, she served as the permanent representative of Iceland. Boy, I've got to read these off in a row. To the United Nations. She served as ambassador of Iceland to the Bahamas. Barbados. How did you wind up in the Arctic stuff? I don't know. Cuba, Dominican Republic, I should have been following, <laughs> Grenada, Guyana, and Jamaica. Ambassador Ellis Darter was head of the Icelandic mission to the European Union from 2014 to 2018. It's something that you find in this town is that the embassies of the Arctic really share a common goal, a common mission, and we have an incredible friendship with all of them. Ambassador, the keynote podium is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much for these kind words. I wish I had been all to all of these very nice places you mentioned here <laughs> before. So good afternoon. Uh, it's a true pressure for me to be here today, uh, learning about the important findings of all the great researchers, scholars in this room. And um, I understand from what I heard last night that uh, you even managed to present the main findings and the recommendations to policymakers in a more compact way than we are used to uh, by the scientific community. Um, we will, of course, study those as a valuable input 
into the considerations of the Arctic we want to see in the future. And I already had a bit of a taste of what will be discussed here today at the reception last night, and I want to thank all of those in here who took the time um, to be there. And, uh, and for me, at least, it's extremely nice to see some very familiar and friendly faces in the audience. Uh, I want to touch upon a few issues Iceland is stressing during its Arctic Council chairmanship and beyond. The Arctic Council has perhaps never been as important as mentioned. And under such pressure, we benefit from the fact that as a forum, the Council's credibility and international status is grounded on more than two decades worth of scientific work and knowledge building by the Council's subsidiary bodies, as well as by researchers such as yourselves. <clears throat> In an increasingly complex world, basing our decision on sound science and know-how is and will be of the essence for sustainable development. People, not least our young people, are calling for responsible decision-making and decisive actions uh, towards sustainability. And events such as uh, this one contribute to and thus support the work of the Arctic Council. And I want to, uh, in this context, to thank the Wilson Center for their tireless efforts in this regard. Thank you so much. In our view, the ultimate goal uh, for the future of the Arctic must be economic prosperity and social well-being in a healthy environment. I, and I think uh, there we see eye to eye. Therefore, a secure and sustainable Arctic is a key foreign policy priority for Iceland. This is not least because our future as a nation is dependent on how things develop in the region. The Arctic, as we all know, is one of the world's regions most affected by climate change or climate crisis, the term being used by the government of Iceland these days. A reality that all of us, governments, industries, and the general public alike, all over the world will need to both adapt and react to in a decisive and responsible manner. And Iceland will try to continue to lead by example. And uh, some of you may have heard of our national climate strategy, which we think is an example of this. Uh, but we also feel that we have much to contribute uh, by the means of knowledge sharing. In Iceland, we have emphasized the importance of striking the right balance on the one hand between the environmental protection and on the other, the economic growth <coughs> and social development. And this means adapting to the negative environmental impacts of climate change, but also identifying and making responsible use of the possibilities that these changes may entail. And the right of the inhabitants of the Arctic to build prosperous yet sustainable communities must be respected. <clears throat> the four million people living and working in the Arctic need to see economic development for future generations, not least the region's in indigenous peoples. And as you may know, the oceans are at the heart of our program. The largest part of the Arctic region is covered by oceans, and the welfare of a large part of the population in the Arctic is based on sustainable utilization of marine resources. While Iceland focuses on continuing and further developing ocean-related projects already underway, we are also particularly interested in strengthening Arctic Council cooperation on mitigating plastic pollution in the oceans. We will also maintain <coughs> an emphasis on meteorological cooperation, and I would like to mention explicitly a project on mapping glaciers, which will provide more accurate information on the dramatic glacial reduction being witnessed in our part of the world, which in turn, of course, affects our oceans. <coughs> the impending shift in energy sources from fossil fuels to renewable energy will continue to be important, both for reducing emissions and improving air quality in Arctic communities. During our chairmanship, Iceland will support continued search for practical green energy solutions, focusing specific specifically on smaller communities in the Arctic. And we very much appreciate the US taking a co-lead uh, in this work in the Council. A most important aspect of all of this is the support for building prosperous and sustainable Arctic communities. The Arctic Council already has a strong record 
of promoting sustainable development and growth in the region. However, adapting to continuous warming of the Arctic will be a major challenge for many smaller Arctic communities, not least the indigenous people. We will therefore continue cooperation on matters like gender equality, connectivity, adaptation and resilience, as well as on economic development. And of course, in that, education, knowledge sharing and innovation will be at the forefront. <coughs> Iceland will further continue to work for a stronger Arctic Council and give due attention to the Council's inner workings. We will also work towards strengthening cooperation with other stakeholders in the Arctic, engaging not only the observers but also businesses, communities and individual Arctic residents. A key for success in that respect is that all actors contribute to the projects of the Arctic Council in a meaningful way. Given the extreme important role of the ocean uh, in regulating the Earth's climate and given that the Arctic region is in large part and increasingly covered by oceans, securing healthy Arctic waters is a key to a sustainable Arctic. In Iceland we feel we know a thing or two about the oceans and we are inviting states as part of our Ar Arctic Council Chairmanship program to explore whether they could benefit from our knowledge in that field. One of the most important lessons learned that Iceland can share is that through innovation and biotechnological, biotechnological solutions, it is possible to increase significantly the utilization level of biomass taken out of the ocean, which in turn leads to increased financial gains throughout the value chain. Um, some Icelandic companies have even managed to eliminate biomass waste from living marine catches, increasing uh, their total product value dramatically. And we feel this is sustainable development at its best. Uh, it will be give um, environment, it is environmental protection, it's economic and social development, and it's giving us a perfect example of how by apply, applying this method and innovation, Arctic communities can thrive and prosper. Another part of securing healthy oceans is caring for the marine environment. And for the longest time, governments were somewhat indifferent towards the amount of litter that was poured directly and indirectly into the oceans. Fortunately, this is changing and the Icelandic chairmanship is giving special attention, as I mentioned, to plastic pollution in the marine environment. And I know you all know the figures about 72% of, of all marine litter being plastic, the tons and tons of plastics that have accumulated in the oceans <coughs> and how much is, um, is uh, entered uh, in, into the oceans every year. Uh, I mean, the numbers are, are, are horrifying and at the continued rate, the amount of plastics in the oceans will surpass fish in by 2050. So it is our duty to stop and fix this while also studying and learning from the effects that this has already had on the marine environment. <coughs> For our actions to achieve best results, we must adjust and prioritize our responses in accordance with best available scientific knowledge. To that end, the Icelandic government will host an international symposium on plastics in the Arctic and the sub-Arctic region in April 2020 in connection with our chairmanship. The conference will bring together leading experts in the field, policymakers and leaders, offering its participants the most up-to-date information on the problem, as well as focusing on best practices and possible actions. And while the conference looks at plastics in the Arctic in particular, the presentations and discussions should be highly relevant for actors outside the Arctic region since, as we know, marine litter is indeed a worldwide problem. <coughs> Bringing the oceans and into the climate agenda is a common task and common responsibility for all of us. Iceland appreciates that this approach is being adopted in international fora around the world and successful conferences being held, or the better, with countries making pledges, such as at, at the recent Our Oceans in Norway. I have not touched upon security issues, 
which I was, was specifically <laughs> asked to do. Uh, but as you know, this is a growing concern. And even if we do acknowledge that the Arctic is still a peaceful region, and we want it to stay that way, at the Arctic Circle in Reykjavik earlier this month, the Prime Minister of Iceland, Katrin Jakobsdottir, said in her opening statement, <coughs> and I quote, Iceland has consistently called for a peaceful and cooperative regime in the Arctic. Increased geopolitical tensions in the region is a deplorable development and highlights the fact that there is no specific Arctic forum to deal with hard security, territorial disputes, or the exploitation of natural resources. It is our collective responsibility to ensure peace and stability in the North Atlantic and the Arctic, preventing the area from falling prey to misguided geopolitical wrestling." Unquote. It is therefore of utmost importance that the rule-based international order prevails, as stated in many of the US Arctic policy documents, and that we strive to safeguard security interests in the Arctic region through civilian means and strong regional cooperation. <coughs> I want to end this by mentioning the explorer and anthropologist Wilhelmur Stefansson, who was born in Canada to Icelandic parents, and as you know, that makes him Icelandic. <laughs> he became a known figure in his time, and I know some of you know him, and he was also a very controversial figure. But his legacy is that he changed the image of the Arctic. The core of his message was that by keeping an open attitude and learning from the people whose ancestors lived in the Arctic for thousands of years, adapting to the environment and accumulating a body of knowledge handed down between generations, we discover that the Arctic can be a friendly and hospitable place. For me, the core is we need to listen and learn from those who live in the region and want to continue to do so in the future. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I understand uh, I should uh, ask if you have any questions, and I will be very happy to answer a couple of them. If you have any, please. I'm trying to see. A is there anyone who wants to answer? Yeah, the lady over there. I see, happy, say happy Halloween to you. Yes, ha happy secular Halloween. I'm a pink, instead of a pink martini, a pink marshini. Um, I'm working with what I have, which, which is what you're doing in, in Iceland with the plastics pollution. And I, I arrived a little bit late, so I don't know if you had a, the opportunity to touch on this. Um, but what are the, uh, is, is there a substantial amount of, of plastics pollution in Iceland as well? And how, how will the um, April 2020 summit on, on addressing plastics pollution in the Arctic, how does that correspond with a lot of the other multilateral meetings that are, um, that are addressing the same issue? And are you looking to your knowledge, at microplastics as well, mm -hmm. in in the uh, in, in any of the ice mm -hmm. ice core in the region. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes, thank you for this question. I mean, uh, the microplastics is actually an issue which has been um, analyzed and researched in Iceland, and and the findings have been quite alar alarming. So this is something that we really need to to uh, work on, and and with with other stakeholders, not only in the region, but all over the world. And as you say, there has been a string of conferences on this issue. And I think, I mean, this is, we are still sort of in the awareness making mode. So hopefully, I mean, we will all uh, find ways to, to fight this together. And, and of course, that we need a lot of resources to do that. We, n we need innovation, we need people who find ways to, to deal with this, but it's definitely an issue in Iceland. And at the Arctic Circle uh, last month, uh, you may know of this conference, which is, which is held every year in, in Reykjavik, um, where you have together, you have scientists, you have policymakers, you have 
activists. I mean, it's a, it's a very good venue for people who are interested in the Arctic to come together. And um, so th uh, this was um, the um, Prime Minister of Greenland was talking about the plastic pollution, the microplastics found in almost all species in Greenland, be it birds or fish or, or whatever. So this is, this is a huge problem. And, and then, of course, you have the, 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 the visible plastics, um, which is now, uh, you know, th our, our shores are littered with it. So, I mean, we have something in Iceland called the Blue Army, isn't it? Yeah. So these are people who go out uh, on a regular basis to clean the, the shores. Uh, we have, I think the U.S. Embassy has participated in this uh, several times, um, our president. So it's a, that's a more symbolic way of dealing with it, I would say. But, you know, but it, it's definitely a problem, yes. Thank you. Any other questions? Sorry, I'm just like, because the light is <laughs> mine, so I have to. <laughs> okay. okay, thank you so much. Thank you, Ambassador. I think that's the perfect foundation upon which the rest of the day now will be built. You hit on every issue uh, that I think we've explored over the last 18 months to two years. We appreciate the friendship and the partnership that we have with the Embassy here in Washington, D.C., and at the Arctic Circle and beyond that. So thank you very much. Now it's a pleasure to introduce our second keynote speaker, Meredith Rubin. She is the United States Senior Arctic Official and is part of the State Department, Bureau of Oceans, International Environmental and Scientific Affairs. She works with key stakeholders to formulate Arctic policy and to represent the United States interests in the Arctic Council. Uh, the full biographies of our speakers and our panelists have been handed out, so you have their full biographies. Uh, Meredith's biography, like others, is substantial. I will pull out the most substantial part of her, of her background is that prior to joining the Foreign Service, she was a scholar here at the Woodrow Wilson International <laughs> Center for Scholars. Meredith. Well, I don't want to take too much credit. Uh, I, was, I was a program assistant here, so <laughs> I'm very familiar with these formats. And and being on the other side. So uh, thank you for having me today. Thank you to the Wilson Center for hosting the symposium and for the support that you've provided to the Fulbright. Um, really proud to be a part of this initiative and we thank you for all of your efforts on that. And I'm really happy to be here today with so many people who care about the Arctic, including the Icelandic ambassador whom we just heard from. As the senior, uh, Arctic official for the United States, I've been working closely with colleagues from Iceland during their chairmanship of the Arctic Council, and they're excellent partners, and we really appreciate the collaboration that we have with Iceland and all of the other states and the permanent participants in the Arctic Council. The United States is cognizant of how changes in the Arctic have created challenges and opportunities for each Arctic nation, including for our own citizens in Alaska. We will continue to work closely with our own uh, citizens, with our partners, and our allies to address these challenges, to embrace the opportunities, and to face the responsibilities that we all have as stewards of this great region. Scientific research, including through the Fulbright Arctic Initiative, is an essential component of United States engagement in the Arctic. Throughout history, we've relied upon our scientific enterprise to help make us, help us to make sense of change. Scientists provide the knowledge that leaders need to navigate uncharted waters in all areas of society. Today, I'd like to briefly highlight three areas that we see as critical for the success of scientific research. Those are funding, expertise, and frameworks for engagement. Uh, first, a little bit about funding. Since 1883, when the first international polar year opened the Arctic region to scientific exploration, the United States has encouraged scientific cooperation, and we've invested more in Arctic scientific research than any other nation. The National Science Foundation alone has averaged more than $100 million per year for the last decade on Arctic research. And it recently further prioritized the Arctic by including uh, the navigating the new Arctic effort as one of its 10 big ideas. And this unlocks additional funding for Arctic research. 
U.S. funding for Arctic research, I'm happy to say, is diverse. It's quite diverse. It includes support for everything from atmospheric sciences to social sciences, everything in between. Activities funded by the U.S. government provide weather, water, and sea ice information for planning and decision making uh, to serve communities and to help manage resources. They also seek to bring needed services to local and indigenous communities, and they continue to support underserved populations within the Arctic. Second aspect I wanted to talk a little bit about is expertise, and I think the United States has a lot to contribute in this area. Um, our long-term investments have helped U.S. researchers and institutions become world leaders, both in conducting and in facilitating high-quality Arctic research. Just to give one example, NASA's ISAT-2 satellite uh, help, will help provide data to scientists as they help to, they search to investigate why and how much our cryosphere is changing in a warming climate. The mission of ISAT-2 will gather enough data to estimate the annual height change of Greenland and Antarctic ice sheets to within four millimeters, which is the width of a number two pencil. Truly, truly impressive. Um, and just one year into its mission, it's already being hailed as providing potentially transformational scientific discoveries. U.S. scientists also continue to lead or contribute to much of the Arctic Council's cutting edge work. Uh, examples include the first biological diversity assessment, the first offshore oil and gas assessment, and the first Arctic shipping assessment. The Fulbright Arctic Initiative continues to be a key part of the United States endeavors in this area, and by bringing the Fulbright Network and its reputation for scholarly excellence to the challenges of the Arctic, the U.S. is helping to advance cutting-edge interdisciplinary research that is useful to national and international policymakers. I met with the Fulbright scholars earlier this week at the State Department to learn more about their work. And as a policymaker, I found their input to be incredibly relevant to our work both for the United States and for the Arctic Council. So thank you very much for that conversation and those discussions. They were fascinating. Uh, just to give folks a little bit more detail about that, some of the discussions that we had included the importance of engaging local communities and integrating indigenous knowledge. Uh, this is something that we will certainly continue to pursue. Uh, we also appreciated the recognition by the Arctic scholars of the importance of a One Health approach and multi-sectoral action to build thriving communities. Scientific research such as this that leads to better and more reliable information is always useful to help inform policy. So thank you very much to the scholars for all of your work. Uh, the, the third area that I wanted to speak about briefly today that we see as critical to the success of scientific research is frameworks. And the U.S. played a, a leading role in creating opportunities and developing frameworks to promote and facilitate greater international scientific cooperation. For, as, for an example, when the United States chaired the Arctic Council, the Arctic states signed a science cooperation agreement to facilitate the movement of scientists, equipment, and data across our borders. This agreement strengthens our ability to cooperate on scientific endeavors that will benefit all peoples, from improving weather forecasting to learning more about how local communities are adapting to their changing environments. The agreement also specifically encourages holders of traditional and local knowledge to participate in scientific activities in the Arctic. And even more recently, as an example of U.S. leadership, the U.S. Interagency Arctic Research Policy Committee, known as IARPIC, revised its principles for conducting research in the Arctic and placed a particular emphasis on the responsibility to respect local culture and knowledge and to advance stewardship of the Arctic environment. While these principles are directed at academic and federal researchers funded by IARPIC, the principles are equally relevant to other individuals or organizations that are pursuing funding, pursuing or funding research in the Arctic. Fulbright is helping to advance these conversations as well, um, on specifically on engaging local communities. At the Nunamid Arctic Health Conference in Nuuk, Greenland, the Thriving Communities Working Group facilitated workshops on ethical guidelines for research with indigenous peoples, as well as on policy recommendations on health and well-being research in the Circumpolar North. 
I want to conclude by noting the importance of collaboration because so many of the issues related to the Arctic are complex and they touch upon multiple scientific areas. The Fulbright Arctic Initiative is an excellent model for collaborative research by bringing together scientists and experts from many countries and many disciplines. Fulbright is helping a diverse group of scholars from around the Arctic to break out of the traditional boundaries of their scientific disciplines. The United States will continue to work closely with partners and allies to support transparent and high quality scientific research that advances our national interests. I'm very pleased that the State Department's Bureau of Educational and Cultural Affairs will be supporting a cohort uh, of Fulbright Arctic scholars starting in 2020, and this will be our third iteration of the program, so it's quite exciting. And I look forward to learning from that new cohort of scholars, as I've learned from the group here in Washington this week, and I very much look forward to hearing the presentations today. Thank you. Thank you. I'm happy to take a question or two, if anybody has any as well. It's an easy crowd. <laughs> Meredith, thank you so much for those, those comments. Two great foundational keynotes. It's like three legs of the stool uh, to hear from Iceland and your leadership in the Arctic Council, to hear from our senior Arctic official about what the United States is doing with our partners domestically, internationally, but also, frankly, to hear that the value, uh, the value that came out from your speech on the work done by these scholars fits so well into both from an international perspective from Iceland, but also from the U.S. informing uh, U.S. policies going forward already uh, makes us all smile. So thank you both for those wonderful keynote addresses. So we've talked a little bit about uh, Fulbright, but, but just a little bit. So I just want to remind us why we're here uh, and what you will see coming up. So our Fulbright Arctic Initiative 2 uh, started about 18 months ago. Again, I want to introduce Ross Virginia. Ross, maybe you should stand and be recognized here as I take the podium. Ross Virginia of Dartmouth College. <laughs> Ross and I on paper are co-lead scholars. Ross and I on paper uh, do this program together. Ross and I on paper are equals. I will tell you that Ross <laughs> has been the person that 16 scholars and myself have leaned on not just for this Fulbright cohort, but the first as well. So where it might appear we are equals, we are not. Ross simply has been the engine behind most of the work you will see here today. So Ross, as a friend and a colleague and a co-lead scholar, I thank you for all the work that you've done on our collective behalf. Ross and I were contacted a few years ago. This is now coming up on six years that we've done this to put together an idea for during the, full, the uh, chairmanship of the United States for the Arctic Council to create a brand new Fulbright. And with IIE and our friends at the State Department at Fulbright, we came up with this concept that Fulbright scholars would, yes, have their Fulbright research, but we'd also should put them in teams. And as the ambassador said and Meredith pointed out, this is an interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary approach. The Arctic simply requires us to think differently, to act differently, and conduct our research differently. And it also requires us to engage differently with the communities that we all serve. And the model today that you will hear about is an evolution of the first model, which again really are three Fulbrights in one, an individual research program, a group program, and then overall policies between the groups. This is a lot of work that goes into 18 months, and these people already have full-time jobs. But we can see the value of the work being done. So I will not bore you with rereading re the titles, but I will bore you for a moment and remind us where we are and what we serve, this dynamically changing environment. And you will hear why it's not only important, but the work should continue, as Meredith pointed out, beginning again in 2020. We're very happy that the State Department has decided once again to fund this program. So this is us in the Fulbright program, uh, 70 years in existence, 8,000 grants per year, almost 400,000 alumni call themselves a Fulbright scholar from 160 countries, 60 Nobel Prizes, 37 heads of state. It is a select group that these scholars are part of, but these people change the world each and every day. And we were focused, of course, on the Arctic. 
I won't bore you with going through it. It's all the things I've just said, but this has continued through the second cohort as well. And I can tell you that we've taken those bullets quite seriously from the public outreach to the multilateral, multidisciplinary approach on and on and on. Every week, every month in plenary sessions, every face-to-face -face meeting. These have been a constant recurrence in our narrative and in our work. As I said before, this is individual and teamwork. We are represented, all eight nations represented, 16 scholars, as I noted, Ross and I as co-lead scholars. You will see what looks like disparate disciplines. They look disparate, but they are not. The other thing I would point out is that this cohort has an incredible number of individuals who are focused on health, community health. This was an area that we were asked to look at from the first cohort, but it also just, or, it just organically came about. The issues of the Arctic are not just about the melting ice cap, which of course is serious, but it really reflects the communities that we serve, and you will hear that today over and over. So it might look like disparate disciplines. They are not. They have complemented each other. It's been quite challenging, as you will hear, but it has worked quite well. There are two thematic working groups which you'll hear from, resilient and thriving communities. You notice the word sustainable is not used. Uh, we were scolded by our scholars about that. We don't, no one wants to um, be sustained. They would like to thrive. I think that's important semantics for all of us to remember. Ross and I certainly will remember it. And sustainable economies, which thriving would be a part of, but sustainable economies purposefully, so that there can be a balance between development and the very region that we love and protect. These are all of us. You'll hear from us in a moment. We built collaboration and understanding. We met first through our friends, uh, Michael Haas in Canada, our first to Iqaluit on Baffin Island. The very first meetings we had were in Iqaluit. Why? Because we needed a community, and Iqaluit was a perfect community to meet. These scholars first met each other. Ottawa and Iqaluit. It was a wonderful filter through which all of our work has been done. It wasn't done in Washington, D.C., and it wasn't done in Toronto, and it wasn't done in Los Angeles, nor was it done in London. It was done in Iqaluit, where we heard from the community about their struggles, not saying that they are the same as other Arctic communities, but boy, they are sure similar, and it was a wonderful filter to go through. I won't bore you with the rest of it, rest of it but twice we had been hosted by our friends, the, the uh, Finland Foundation, Fulbright Foundation, in Helsinki and Oulu, and today we are here all week in Washington, D.C. You have uh, with you this policy brief. As the ambassador noted, it took a lot of work to condense 18 months of actionable research into a usable policy briefing that we hope is just a path toward other research. You'll hear more depth here today, but this document, I think, is very useful to all of us. Uh, I have seen cohort documents from the first Fulbright uh, on State Department desks, DOD desks, ONR desks, and I've seen them overseas as well. So we know they were used in the first cohort. We certainly know that they will be used in the second cohort. The very first panel you will hear from is from Resilient to Thriving Communities. These are the members of that group. These are the institutions they represent, uh, and you will see the expertise that they will bring to the panel discussion. Before we go to the panel, though, we thought that it would be a wonderful way to begin this panel and then the panels going forward uh, with something which is, is quite powerful. Uh, not my words, not a senior Arctic official's words, not an ambassador's words, but the words of the communities that we serve. So with that, I want to invite up to the podium Sean Gustini. Sean is the manager of Nunavut Arctic College Media. Now, media not in the sense of IT and projections and iPhones. Media in terms of preserving a culture, projecting that culture, and a way to sustain a community. So Sean, I will invite you to the podium to introduce yourself and your piece. Thanks, Mike. And thanks to everyone here and people joining at home online. Also, thank you to Fulbright uh, IIE, thank you so much, Greta and Susan. Uh, State Department, Mr. Steve Money, um, and the Wilson Center staff who were, have been so supportive in the last couple days. Thank you for all your help. This, this uh, collective of people, the, the, the care and dedication over the last 18 months has really been a foundation for us to, uh, be, to care and be dedicated, so thank you. I am a member of the Thriving Communities Group. 
our job is to foreground people and places in the policy process. That's what we've been focused on in our work, our daily work, but also in our Fulbright work. So we wanted to begin with a visual piece to evoke the, the various themes that we, we are and have been and continue to work on over the last 18 months, and also to evoke some of the complexities, the contradictions, and the historical contexts of working in the Arctic. Sometimes the history of, of, of policy and the, and the complexities of the historical contexts are not mentioned uh, in our discussions. So, uh, and some of those are often quite difficult and challenging, uh, and we wanted to offer a visual piece to introduce our panel. So we'll let the, uh, the voices do the talking. Thank you. maybe and they study something for one year or for a few months and then that's their big like life's work eh? and they talk about that for years and years and what you learn when you spend a long time in one place like around here say is that what you thought was true five years ago or ten years ago is really not true at all you see things that you never expected to happen People don't know anything about the North or the Arctic and its people. Very little. In fact, they have a notion of, um, of something they've heard in the past. The most noticeable thing, of course, is that Eskimos now are living in one place, they're working at one job, and they have to live a completely new way of life. They used to hunt seal and walrus, they used to follow a trap line. They had a nomadic way of life. Now they have to settle down at one job, work regular hours, live in one place, get used to the kind of house we have, the kind of food we have, and all that sort of thing. It's having a very profound effect. And though the views of social scientists who've told me what the native people want are important, the most important opinions of all are those expressed at the community hearings by the native peoples themselves. But they never realized how advanced we were because we had the ability to survive in the Arctic. You know, our people had traditional ecological knowledge and that's what kept them alive for thousands of years in the Arctic when the Western people came. They couldn't survive without the natives. Mm. Extinction of language, mm. of languages and culture, that's uh, one uh, big issue for us. Uh, it's a lot of, uh, um, really it's like this, that most of the Sami people don't speak their own language anymore. They lost the language and a lot of Sami people don't even know that they are Sami people or uh, don't want to tell that they are. We didn't even understand the term human rights then. And of course it was no concern of the federal government yeah. then. And, and they had this uh, policy of assimilation. Uh, we were told that our language and culture were, were going to die and that we had to 
we had to learn a new language, learn a trade, and, and uh, forget about our traditional way of life. The native peoples are seeking their land claims before That's it exactly, the Pierre. Mm. Exactly. When people are, are fighting for something which is very precious to them, it, it's, it's very difficult not to try it. Uh, people have to start realizing that you can only take so much out of the earth. The earth is only so big, and you can only take so much out of it. When it's gone, it's gone. Your rights, whether they be historic or more recently obtained, for instance, under an agreement, that those rights must be ongoing, and that if... Alive. Alive. That's a better word. Alive. The social fabric of our communities needs to be strengthened. I'm talking about the well-being of the person, both physically, mentally, and socially. Often when I speak to the public, I talk about all the good things that are happening in the North, but in inevitably I have to talk about some of the difficulties because ignoring by ignoring them we're not going to fix them either so it's talking about it and talking about it to each other and to people of influence that can help make some good policy choices about the arctic i think that would make a difference <laughs> Yeah, we didn't want to see that. This is what we want to see right here. Sean, thanks for that incredible look back and great path forward. We appreciate that. Again, perfect scene setter for the next group. So with that, let me invite my colleagues from the Resilient to Thriving Communities to come take the podium. So thank you all for coming here today, and thanks, Sean, for framing the work that we're going to share. Uh, when we came together as the Resilient Communities Group, was our original title, in Iqaluit, you can see that picture on the left is from us in Iqaluit, and we also met in Ottawa. And our second meetings were in Oulu and Helsinki. One of the first things we did is discuss the term resilience, which a number of us felt was something that our communities and our experiences um, told us was, was a word that was not acceptable to our communities. It felt like we were constantly under attack or were continuing to, to resist instead of just living and thriving in our communities. Um, and so we decided that perhaps thriving might be a better term for our group. Uh, however, we wanted to test that out a little bit, and our approach to this work has been community-driven. And part of that is because most of us are from the north. Our families live in the north. Um, this is a community and a place that we're accountable to. Uh, so our work is always driven by those community members, those people that, that are part of our families and part of our communities and part of our social circles. Um, and we have a lot of ex experience with diverse voices in Arctic communities. We're from different regions in the north. However, we wanted to gather additional information about this term resilient to see if there were other people's networks that also told them that perhaps this was a term that was um, needed to be revised. So we conducted a sharing circle. And a sharing circle is an indigenous methodology that's been used for millennia in communities in the north. Um, and just to give you a brief description, it's where people sit in a circle. You might have also heard of a talking circle. And you go around the circle and each person is invited to share their thoughts and feelings about a particular question or topic that a facilitator poses. So each voice is equal in the circle. Everyone is given a chance to speak. Um, and then the next person is given their chance and their opportunity to share their thoughts as well. And it's a way to level the playing field where there isn't a hierarchy. Everyone is treated equally in that space. 
So we conducted a sharing circle at the International Congress on Circumpolar Health in Copenhagen. And we asked them about the term resilient, what that meant to them, what that felt like. We also asked them what made their communities good places to live, which for us, we felt like thriving was potentially a more useful term, but we wanted to check this. And of course, we have experiences in our own context, but wanted to see what other people thought. Um, so from this very international, international circumpolar audience, they reaffirmed our feelings that perhaps thriving was not, or th resilient was not the best fit, and that thriving worked better, although there were different words in different languages, which I think also our work has shown us that being respectful of context is quite important. And you can see some things that people thought were aspects of thriving communities, um, things like relationships and kindness, the people that live in our communities, and also connection to the land and celebrating our diversity. We published a paper on it, so there's just a screenshot of that up there if you'd like more information on that as well. Another thing that we've come to as a group is this idea of an iceberg. And you might be familiar with icebergs that you can see a bit of the ice on top, but if you were to look underneath, there's a lot more mass and volume that lives underneath the ice. And we thought this was similar to the way that research is often done on health and wellness in the north, where the things that are often looked at represent the top of that iceberg. There are epidemiologic studies on things like mortality rates, rates of suicide, incidence and prevalence, often of deficits, often of diseases. But we felt like there's so much more if you look underneath the surface. There's the things that make our communities good places to live. There's the strengths and the capacity and the leadership that already exist, things that we could enhance to support wellness in the North. Um, this also, oops. This also led us to think about, well, why do we look at those epidemiologic indicators? Who is it that determines what we look at? Who's making those decisions about it and, and deciding what it is we're looking for? And perhaps we need to take ownership of that narrative. And as researchers and scientists, we need to be more intentional about considering what we're looking for, because what questions we ask will, of course, determine what it is that we're going to find. So directing us to look more underneath the surface of the ice. And of course, in doing that, it led us to new questions about, well, what are the ethical considerations in deciding what we look for and who we ask about what those priorities are? You know, how do we engage community in those processes to make sure that the indicators are developed in partnership with communities and are co-created with those individuals? How do we work with governance? How do we de de develop methodologies that are respectful of these indicators? And how do we develop it in a strengths-based way? So I'm going to pass this on to some of my colleagues in our thriving communities group who will share a little bit more about our policy recommendations. Thanks, Katie. Um, I think I shall start by introducing myself. Um, my name is Jung Peter Stur. Um, in Northern Sami, that would be Nilsan Tepiatar. So I am a Sami and a, a Swedish clinical psychologist from northernmost parts of Sweden, and I work for the Sami Norwegian National Advisory Unit for Mental Health and Substance Abuse um, as a PhD student now. So I'm researching suicide and suicide prevention among young Sami men in Norway and Sweden. Um, and I'm going to talk to you about the first sections of our um, policy recommendations. Oh no, do you want to mention the, all four of them first or? Go ahead. All right, so I'm going to talk to you about the ones uh, on uh, figure one. So acknowledge and integrate indigenous rights and knowledges, those four there. Um, and that will be indigenous rights to implement the United Nations declarations on the rights of indigenous peoples, the UNDRIP declaration in all the countries participating in Arctic research. And also indigenous knowledges, to ensure indigenous knowledges, expertise and com community perspectives are integrated effectively into policy and health system design in local, regional, state, federal and international levels of governance. And also in uh, the Arctic Council, to expand the Arctic Council's permanent participants to the same status as states in the consensus building in the Arctic Council. And there I'd like to say that we do acknowledge that the permanent participant status in the Arctic Council is perhaps the best practice that we have, but still we think it can be better. 
And also the funding issue to allocate funding for organizations working to advance the rights of Arctic peoples. Oftentimes those are non-governmental organizations run on very, very limited resources and funding. Um, and I'm going to give you two more in-depth uh, examples uh, of two of these recommendations. So I'm going to start with the example on how to how we can use implementation of indigenous rights to actually address uh, health inequities in the Arctic. Um, so in in our iceberg analogy, I have a problem with that. We don't have icebergs in northern Sweden. <laughs> so there are, there are two possibilities there that they that we actually don't have them or that we're not looking for them or that we're not maybe looking for them hard enough. And of course, the, it might be the case that we don't have them because we don't have sea. But in our analogy, the, these icebergs, they're really epidemiological health outcomes. So the icebergs are equivalents of indigenous health outcomes that are worse than non-indigenous health outcomes. And um, speaking from my own country, my own context, we have a problem here because how to measure that, we do it with quantitative measurements. And in Sweden, you're not allowed to register ethnicity. So that at the very foundation of these uh, measurements, it's hard to do, basically. It's hard to do that research. So from my, our point of view, maybe we aren't looking hard enough for icebergs. Um, and we're actually, we're not the first ones to, to observe this. Um, 12 or even 13 years ago, the then um, special UN, United Nations Special Rapporteur on Everyone's uh, Right to Health, he visited Sweden. This was a New Zealander, Paul Hunt. And he congratulated Sweden on acknowledging the Sami people as an indigenous people of Sweden. And that was done in the late 70s. But he also, he was quite clear and criticized Sweden as well. Uh, in his official report that was released in 2007. And I quote from that and reading that he regrets that he found little, if any, evidence that Sweden has translated the special status of the Sami into meaningful practical measures in the health context. And especially uh, he talked about this, uh, the lack of um, or that we can't register ethnicity and how that affects uh, the ability to measure health outcomes. And he wrote, if they do not know the scale and nature of the problem, how can they devise the most appropriate interventions? And if an intervention were introduced, how would they know whether or not it was effective? So these are really the basics, the foundations that were criticized. And so in our recommendation, when we recommend uh, implementing UNDRIP, we think that would be a solution to this because that would mean having to acknowledge the Sami's rights to know about our health. And um, I'm, I'm sorry to say that at the moment, Sweden is the only Arctic nation except for Iceland, which doesn't have a indigenous population that hasn't yet translated the UNDRIP declaration. So more than 10 years after signing the declaration, we haven't even translated it into Swedish. So it's, it's really not being used. So there's a lot of work to, to be done in Sweden and elsewhere. And a second example um, on how, how to use indigenous traditional knowledge to prevent suicide. <clears throat> and this comes from my own research and my own research visit in, in Fairbanks, Alaska. Um, what I did first was arrange workshops in northern Sweden for young Sami men, because that is the, our biggest risk group for suicide in, among the Sami people in Sweden, ra young reindeer herding Sami men. Um, and that is an issue that we need to address, and we wanted to do it in an innovative way. So we tried to utilize uh, yoiking technique. And yoiking is what you heard in the end of, of the film Sean showed you. Um, so it is a way of singing and also a way of expressing yourself. And these young men, they, they do not necessarily want to sit down in a, 
in a psychiatric office and have a chat with me in a face to face like this. So we need to find other ways. So we try to, uh, you know, invite them to think of yoiking as a way of expressing themselves. And while doing so, also recognizing their own feelings, learning to recognize their own feelings uh, and deal with their emotions in that way. So regulate their emotions through using yoiking as a tool. Basically, traditional knowledge that we have always had, but thinking about it consciously. Um, so that's one example of how you can use it. And there's, um, when I was in Fairbanks, I visited with Dr. Stacy Rasmus there, and she has many, many research projects on how to utilize culture and traditional knowledge to prevent suicide. And it's, this is an issue that is certainly gaining speed um, as the World Indigenous Suicide Prevention Conference next year is seeking more of these examples. So indigenous peoples are really realizing that this could be a way forward in addressing the suicide issues. Thank you. <clears throat> I'm Christina Larsen, and in this uh, program I represent Greenland and Denmark. I uh, direct a center for public health in Greenland, which is based both in Copenhagen and uh, Nuuk. And we do a lot of monitoring, so I'll, I'll speak to our third recommendation piece, which focuses on expanding monitoring and assessment programs. And to address health and well-being and, and the inequities in the Arctic in a meaningful way, we need to make sure that, that monitoring programs for health and well-being are in place. And in some, some Arctic regions, um, such as, as Petr just talked about, that means that monitoring systems need to be established. In other regions, it, ne it means that they need to be strengthened, and we need to make sure that the monitoring is coordinated between different agencies and sectors through collaboration. So how do we do that? How do we make sure that monitoring systems for health and well-being are in place? Well, the Thriving Communities Group, we believe that these monitoring programs must go beyond the epidemiological indicators that often dominate the discussions on health in the Arctic. And these are the icebergs that, that Katie also mentioned. Because that's, that's not enough and it, it, can't, it cannot stand alone. So we need to make sure that, in, that indigenous ethical guidelines are followed uh, in monitoring programs. We need to be innovative in our ways of developing indicators to make sure that these are community-driven, that they're relevant, and that they're meaningful in their context. Identifying indicators for thriving communities through a, a, a circumpolar sharing circle was what uh, Katie told you about. And, and this is an example of an innovative method to, that's also in line with indigenous science and ways of sharing information among Arctic peoples. And just to give you an example um, of how indicators then look different if you use innovative methods. I wanted to put the model for different indicators of th or different elements of thriving communities up there again. Um, so when we look at this, it's not mortality. Uh, it's not infectious diseases that we see. Uh, it's about being healthy. It's about connection to land. It's about kindness and humility. So it's important that we are innovative and that we use mixed methods uh, and that the work's community-driven when we work to expand monitoring and assessment programs. And then I want to talk a little bit more about um, community-driven strategies, because we have so many examples of research and projects that are not connected with what's already going on in Arctic communities and what strategies are already in place to address inequities. We often meet people from outside of the Arctic who come to our home and they say, well, this is what we see as your problem, or this is what we see as your solution. Instead, we would like to see that community-driven strategies that are already in place are the ones that are being supported, that are being implemented, and that are being evaluated. And because we share so many strengths and challenges across the Arctic, we must share information. We must share information about successful programs, about experiences to promote health and well-being across communities, and not just within a region, al that, although that's important also, but across Arctic communities throughout all of the circumpolar world. 
The Arctic Council project creates is a great example of information sharing. I'll just let you uh, see the, the logo. And it was a, a project that was created under the Sustainable Development Working Group when Finland uh, had the chairmanship before Iceland, and it focused on mental wellness and suicide prevention among youth. And in this project, um, which was led by ICC, youth from several uh, Arctic communities or Arctic regions, were um, they created digital stories about life and death or both, and then they shared them on this project website, which you can all access. And this was to enable a circumpolar, youth-driven dialogue. And the stories are pretty powerful. So I encourage you to visit the website as you think about the importance of allocating funding for information sharing about community-driven programs that promote health and well-being in the Arctic. Thank you. And I will pass this on to you. Thank you, Christina. Good afternoon. My name is Josie Lavoie, and I'm the director of Ongomazin Research, which is one of the oldest and uh, largest indigenous health research center in Canada, located at the University of Manitoba. And that center has a long history of partnership-based research with indigenous communities. Those that, that pathway, if you want, was first carved in partnership with Josie Kusugak, the late Joseph Kusugak, which some of you might know from way back in the Arctic, an old friend. Um, I'm gonna be speaking to implementing community-led critical research approaches. And I was really pleased that the video that you presented, Sean, actually talked about that, the idea of helicopter research. This is some, the idea of researchers coming to communities for a day, a month, maybe a year, and then publishing for the rest of their career based on the incredible experience that they had in living in the north and working in the north or visiting the north is always a moving experience. But the risk attached to helicopter research is, of course, the decontextualization of knowledge, the extraction of what is important, but from a lens that is not from the community. The risk of distortion is important. Uh, so lately, we've been hearing about people coming back to the community to give back knowledge. And that is an improvement, the idea that the knowledge that we generate should actually benefit the community so we come back to share that knowledge. But it falls short of the kind of commitment we would advocate for. What we're asking for is the co-creation and co-production of knowledge. And what we mean by that is that they want partnership where projects are co-created by with indigenous community partners, where there is a, a uh, sharing of power and of decision making where there is funding of the community to be an equal partner in that relationship where there is reciprocity and that we would like to have those principles embedded in ethics and I'll come back to the issue of ethics in a moment so to illustrate what that looks like in practice I'm going to give example of a project that I've been involved with since well, conversation started in 2014 when I moved back to Manitoba after a few years of absence and was approached by an Inuk leader, is a senior Wayne Clark, a senior uh, public servant with Manitoba Health, who is, um, has been involved in creating a non-government organization called the Manitoba Inuit Association to try to advocate for the need of Inuit who come from the Kivalik region to Winnipeg, so I'm just north of the Dakota by now, just to situate you, uh, to access complex services, whether it's health, education, economic development, and so on. Um, and the fact that Inuit have been coming to Manitoba, not out of choice, but because opportunities are unevenly distributed. And finding Manitoba an environment that is not Inuit-centric and not responsive to their needs. And so we started working with the board of this organization together from day one and co-created a proposal, which was funded. As a result of that proposal, we embarked on analyzing data that was pre-collected by the, the government of Manitoba. And while we were doing that, we were engaging with the community to get their impression of what was important to them. The first thing we realized is that there was no Inuit community in Winnipeg. 
there were groups of people. We knew people were coming. There are 16,000 medical trips a year coming from a region of 8,000 people. So you do the math. Uh, at great expenses and great trauma and great inconvenience for, for uh, the families, for Inuit and their families. But there was no sense of community in Winnipeg. And so what we did is we started having community event. And you see some of the slides, our feast that we had and Inuit games and trying to bring the community together and have conversation. So in response to that, what we heard is food insecurity, a great deal of difficulty in accessing uh, especially traditional food in Winnipeg. And so we started opening pathways and including feast and food distribution to our events in continuing our communication with community to say, okay, what else do you need? And what we heard over and over again is that the services that Manitoba offers, which are good health services, are not responding to Inuit needs. And often the services are delivered based on misunderstanding, sometimes stereotypes, sometimes racism, but miscommunication most often. And so we picked up the phone and, and tried phoning for a clinic that could start developing Inuit Center programming. And we found that clinic through a former student. And so we leverage as researchers our connection together with the community, together with the board, to try to transform the community in which Inuit relocated to make it a gentler community to step into and to find community throughout. That had nothing to do with the research project, but that had everything to do with the principles of partnership, of supporting community um, the community in the research process of reciprocity. Now, in our circumpolar work, what we have done is to look for, in the research guidelines, where is it in the research guidelines that where those principles might be embedded so that it creates an obligation and a culture of recipro reciprocity and partnership. And we found them in Canada. They are quite entrenched. There was quite a bit of pushback initially by the research community when those guidelines were developed 10 years ago. But they've become the norm, accepted, and actually uh, with a recognition that this produced better work. But we did not find them to be as well articulated in the United States. And we are definitely still working on trying to support the development of those guidelines in other countries. And I will leave it at that. There we go. Um, Avalota, good afternoon. I'm Nicole Kanira, and I work with the North Slope Borough Department of Wildlife Management in Utkalvik, Alaska. Um, I did my visit in Iceland where I learned about fish skin innovation and um, the innovation there. So what I'll be speaking about is um, taking meaningful action to address indigenous determinants of health, but this recommendation applies across um, um, different topics, including my background, which is in wildlife management. Um, so taking meaningful action and engagement is vital to make things work in the Arctic. So how do we do this? With local innovations in the Arctic, without, with local innovations in the Arctic. In the Arctic, you cannot count whales or polar bears or address coastal erosion or address health determinants with the, without the um, two recommendations we have of local innovations and indigenous leadership. If you went to the Arctic 2050 conference, they talked about the approach in counting whales with and without communities on the sea ice. And this had drastic impacts to the communities in the decisions they made based on the best available science they had back in the 70s. Um, that showed that the whales were not doing good. And they um, applied a moratorium on whaling, but they learned from this. They learned when, when working with communities, they learned when, where, and how bowhead whales migrate. They created the tools and approaches to make useful research in the Arctic possible. 
So we need to do this also by empowering indigenous leadership in governance and structures and understanding the connections and complexities in the Arctic. In this context, we're talking about addressing health determinants, but these recommendations are broader. Um, to take meaningful action, we need to inform the systems and support underrepresented groups, including youth and elders. How? By creating meaningful pathways for Arctic communities to inform systems at all scales. These pathways need to be more than an opportunity to comment on a federal register notice or, or um, to kind of voice your indigenous knowledge in a um, management um, meeting on polar bears. There needs to be innovative pathways for indigenous people to have a voice because it is our because it's our right and our rights need to be alive. Same with addressing health and well-being policies. We need more space, resources, and flexibility to do this, um, to be able to thrive. Um, Koyanuk, I um, would like to thank Fulbright for um, giving the space um, for us to work together where we can actually grapple um, on these questions important to our communities and um, hopefully create um, meaningful research to the communities, to the Arctic, and to um, the, the international, um, into the globe. I was going to say, please recognize the panel, but you're one step ahead of me. So thank you for that. Uh, we have, I'm going to do a traditional Wilson audible and change the agenda around. We're still going to end about 4 o'clock, but I'm going to take a little bit more time here for some questions and answers. We'll take about a 10, 15-minute break, and then we'll come back for the second panel. The second panel fits quite nicely uh, after this uh, first panel, which is from global to local, scales of risk and pathways to sustainable Arctic economies. I think, uh, so if you have a question or two, we'll take those, but I think what you have seen here today is uh, a contrast, perhaps, and maybe a refocusing of some of our efforts, or you've discovered some of the additional efforts happening in regard to the work with Arctic and with the Arctic communities. And that is this, we spend a lot of time in this town and other towns talking about things like great power competition, uh, NATO in the Arctic, the second fleet redeployment, uh, China's investment in the Arctic and elsewhere, U.S. foreign policy related to fill in the blank. Very important issues, and we should spend time on that. What we have heard today is really the rhythm of the Arctic. These are the issues that Arctic people worry about. These are the issues that these scholars are trying to help them address with them, not at them, not for them, but with them. And so I like this work being done. And again, this has been organic. Ross and I had some ideas, but what you have seen are people engaged with the community, reflecting community needs, and the community asking them to work with them on the issues, not like they don't worry about the other ones, but when the issues are right in front of us, like all of us, these are the ones most important to us. And what this panel reflects is what's most important in some areas of some communities but you can weave a thread through all of them. So I want to thank you all for teasing out a very important issue that sometimes gets lost in big headlines or in bumper stickers. Thank you all very much. Let me open it up for one or two questions, and then we'll take a quick break. In the back, to my left. Thank you all. Oh, it's on. Thank you. Uh, uh, my, my question's relating to... Uh, youth and youth mental health with regard to the SAMI and then with uh, regard to the, the digital tools that are being used for helping uh, create self self expression and, and story sharing is are those types of tools 
like creating digital content at all um, in the cultural norms or culturally appropriate for the Sami? And and if so, um, are there, with, with the high suicide rates, are there any, I, I guess, tre- uh, I don't want to say trends, that just sounds so trite, but are there, is it at all, is any of any of that coming from, like it is here in the U.S. and in Canada, this, uh, with the youth in particular, um, a lot of the, the online bullying and digital identity issues, and um, I, I guess, you know, there's that double-edged sort of technology where it concerns um, self-expression, and, and we're seeing that uh, quite a bit, uh, even in current headlines globally, but with youth in particular, um, and indigenous youth, who've already gone through so much you know, cu- cultural identity shifts and living in two or three worlds, as it were, is that, a, is that something that can be um, it, digital technologies used to enhance traditional um, identity and therefore mental health? Thank you. I, I think I know where that might have been first directed, but please, either. Who wants to start? So Project Creates was to create the opportunity for youth to share across because often it's, you know, researchers or policymakers that go to circumpolar meetings and talk about youth, but the youth don't have the opportunity to share the stories across. And the reason that um, we work with digital stories is because stories is how you know, people share. And so the culturally relevant piece are the stories. And then digitalize them is a tool we have these days. So the response that we had, it, it was developed and it was lit, led by ICC, which is one of the six per- permanent participants in the um, Art Day Council. The response we had before initiati- I mean, initiating it was that it was a good way to work, and that was what youth uh, responded as well, because that is a relevant consideration. Um, so, so I think I'll, I'll speak to that. We didn't, um, none of the youth in the stories that they uh, did, which were prompted within the frame of suicide prevention, and as I said, like write a story about life, death, or both. Um, none of them addressed digital bullet, uh, bullying, so I, I don't know if that was a part of what, uh, what they wanted to say. It, w- it didn't come up in those stories, but I think it's a relevant issue for, for youth across the globe. Um, so, it, and, and I mean, I will, I'll encourage you to visit the websites because there's also interesting uh, different narratives coming out of Sami youth, coming out of, of Inuit youth, and coming from different regions, and, and so there's lots of, of, uh, of interesting stuff there. So I, I think I'll leave it with that. Yeah, um, I'll say that um, in general, there's a huge lack of knowledge and this is, it's a lack of knowledge in this area as well. But we do know that, for example, young adult Sami who report being or experiencing themselves as discriminated against, those also tend to report more or higher levels of suicidality. So more um, suicidal thoughts and more suicidal plans, for example. Um, but I'll, I'll, in regards to the role of cultural and, and culture and strengthening culture, Sami are perhaps in a bit of a different situation than the other indigenous peoples because we're a very small minority in our homelands. And so even though we know that culture and uh, being connected to culture and traditions is very helpful for mental well-being, it's also the case that those young Sami who have the strongest cultural identity. So for example, the ones who are actively involved in reindeer herding and the ones who are speaking the Sami language, those will also be the same ones who are at highest risk for suicidality. And that's a paradox. And it's certainly related to that position of being in a minority. And it's my fear would be that we have a situation where where the discrimination, the, the, the issue of having an open Sami identity is a driver of bad health because it exposes you to other negative outcomes. And that's very, that's not a good thing because it means also that you're perhaps able to avoid 
those negative outcomes through abandoning your culture and assimilating. So it might be that we're seeing um, these issues as, as driving assimilation, and that, that's not what we want to see. Thank you. I think in, in the interest of time, uh, we'll have some more time later on at 4 p.m. There'll be a reception across the hall, so there is other time to engage with these scholars as well. I would like to take a 15-minute break or so, so 2.45, the second and third panels, one right after the other. Uh, and then at 4 p.m., we have a reception across the hall. So 15 minutes. Once again, would you thank these wonderful scholars? Thank you all. <laughs>